I've been at Datadog for about two years working on the Temporal platform uh, within Datadog. I was at Replay last year, um, and after talking to people last year and this year, uh, it seems like it seems like uh, people have faced the similar problems as us, where they have to deal with payloads over the Temporal platform size limits. Um, so today, I'm really excited to announce that we have uh, open sourced our Temporal Large Payload Service. It's composed of a large custom large payload codec and a large payload HTTP server, and it transparently handles large payloads for your workflow and activity inputs. Um, and we're really looking for feedback from the community and from the upstream maintainers uh, so we can have a, a solution for everybody. If you're not aware, there are some platform limitations for Temporal, so there's a two megabyte or four megabyte um, workflow and activity input and output limit. Uh, you can configure this around a little bit, uh, but things start to slow down significantly. Uh, there's also a hard 50 megabyte workflow history size limit, uh, and when you hit that, uh, you're not going anywhere. So uh, if we hit that, our workflows will stop, and we need a way around this. There is a fairly simple solution, which is instead of passing around the whole payload, we're just going to store it somewhere else and pass around a reference to the payload. Before I get into how we accomplish this, I want to go through sort of the major requirements we had in mind when designing our system. First and foremost, we want the workflows to be able to handle large payloads without any code changes. At Datadog, we've got a lot of large, long-running workflows, and we want these to be able to pick up uh, any changes we make and be able to handle large payloads seamlessly. Uh, we also want use of large payloads to be transparent to applications and users so that they can opt in very easily and start using them uh, as they wish. We also want the solution to be very easily configurable uh, and completely cloud agnostic. On the first point, we run a developer platform within Datadog that supports hundreds of engineers across you know, dozens of workers in different domain spaces. Uh, so we want to reduce toil for them. And it also needs to be cloud agnostic. We run in all three major cloud providers. So any interface we expose needs to be consistent across all three. This is a high level architecture diagram of how we went through it. We essentially have the temporal worker and then we have a custom data converter and payload codec that then reaches out to an HTTP server backed by a blob storage system in whatever cloud provider we're running in. Uh, so it's really simple. We'll take any large payload over a certain size threshold and store it in blob storage and then pass around a reference to said payload. Uh, I'm going to break down each part if you're not familiar with them. We're going to start with the data converter and the payload codec. This is the payload codec interface uh, that Temporal has. And uh, you might have seen this if you've implemented your own custom payload codec. Uh, the most common use cases are for encryption or compression. Um, a lot of people have probably used the encryption one. We have one at Datadog as well. Um, the difference between your sort of run-of-the-mill encryption codec and this custom codec is that the encryption codec will typically run local and stay local to the worker process and not make outbound calls to another service. So this is what a sample payload encoding looks like. We basically receive a payload over a certain size. We have the data and any metadata that the user sets. And then we will return to that user a key to go look up this payload for later use, as well as some other metadata, such as the size, and most importantly, the digest. The digest allows us to perform data integrity checks at multiple steps along the way. Uh, this would also be important. Uh, we don't have this yet, but we could implement sort of a multi-tiered caching strategy to more efficiently retrieve payloads. This is what a payload encoding looks like in an actual workflow history. Um, so instead of the actual payload, you just see a reference to a key that is uh, that you can use to go and look up the payload. Right now, uh, in our open source libraries, we have a Go SDK implementation for this codec with potentially more planned. Uh, we'd love to get some feedback from the community first and from the upstream maintainers before we go adding other SDKs and whatnot. So that was the payload codec and the data converter, and now I want to talk about the large payload service and the backing blob storage. So the large payload service is just an HTTP server with an encode and a decode path that are just gets and puts for these large payloads. And uh, at Datadog, we run you know, completely multi-cloud. So we have drivers that support S3, GCS, Azure blob storage, and then we also support an in-memory driver that we use uh, for testing. We like testing locally at Datadog. We've open sourced Temporal Lite last year, uh, and now we're trying to open source this, get the community to uh, play around with it and see what people think. So that was sort of a high level overview of the architecture, all of the pieces. Uh, it's really simple. I'll pause here. Um, 
Some people like this view a little bit more, I've been told. So this is a sequence diagram sort of showing the life of a payload. Uh, this is an encoding diagram. It shows the, the path. Um, so given a very large payload, uh, we would write that to the blob storage and then return a reference to it. I've mainly shown the encode path, but the decode path is extremely similar. It's just done in reverse. Great, so that was a brief overview of the architecture. Hopefully nobody is asleep right now, but now I wanna go into sort of like the lessons that we've learned while running this in production for the last years, uh, and also a lot of caveats that uh, people need to be aware of if they wanna try this themselves. Um, I've also, you know, at this conference, it seems like other people have implemented similar solutions, uh, so I'm excited to hear about that in the Q&A. Uh, first off, trade-offs. Uh, you are making serious performance trade-offs anytime you wanna add something like this to your system. The larger the payloads are, the slower your workflow and activity task executions are going to be on the worker process. And then you have the added latency of the data converter itself making those you know, get and put requests. Uh, this is also going to result in much worse replay and query performance if you rely heavily on those. Um, so if you have you know, very stringent latency requirements for any workflow or activity you're running, this is probably not what you wanna be uh, designing with. Uh, one last note is that there's a much higher potential we found for workers running out of memory. We manage sort of a very large temporal ecosystem at Datadog. And so as soon as you know some workers started passing around larger payloads than usual, other workers were consuming these uh, and they weren't ready for that. And so they didn't have enough memory to actually consume them. Uh, this is a graph right here of the P99 latency for the get and put pass for one of our temporal uh, large payload services running in production. The, the put pass fairly stable around three to 400 milliseconds uh, for the P99 latency, and the get path is fairly stable between you know, 150 and 300 milliseconds. Our typical payload sizes are between you know, like one megabyte to 100 megabytes typically, uh, so nothing absolutely massive, but uh, I would say most fall within the one to 10 megabyte range for the large payloads. Next, one thing we quickly found out was that you may run into timeouts. So in the Go SDK specifically, uh, I think this exists in other SDKs. I mainly work with the Go SDK. There is this potential deadlock detected timeout. Um, I believe it's if any Go routine doesn't yield for over one second. Uh, and we were hitting this in our data converter for especially large payloads. Uh, luckily, the temporal maintainers have this data converter without deadlock detection option. So we just slapped that on it and we were ready to go. Uh, one thing we haven't actually experimented with is hitting the 10 second workflow task timeout. I, that is my question for the Q&A for the audience actually. I wanna see if anybody has actually hit, managed to hit this 10 second workflow task timeout in a data converter. Uh, we don't exactly know the failure mode there. Uh, so, you know, it's we've had a lot of challenges rolling this out and managing it ourselves for a while. Uh, so we're looking for some feedback from the community and some upstream people. Um, some potential improvements we can make to this. Uh, if you saw Eric G's presentation yesterday, we invest a lot in our CLI tooling and our you know, UI tooling. Uh, so we would like better support to be able to display these large payloads in UIs and uh, locally. The trickiest problem we're facing right now is ensuring that the blob lifecycle matches a workflow lifecycle. So how do we know when it's safe to actually get rid of one of these large payloads? Uh, and it's no longer being referenced by any workloads. We don't ever need to like go into the workflow history and uh, get it out from archival. Um, for this reason, we've thought about potentially storing full payloads with archival workflows for compliance reasons that would allow us to get rid of uh, the payloads um, from other blob storage systems, but trade-offs. Uh, finally, we would like to, you know, we have an internal authorization framework built around the temporal authorization framework, and we would like better support for authorizing based on the content of large payloads. Um, we um, we uh, we authorize based on you know, JSON web tokens and a bunch of other things internally, um, and we also authorize on workflow and activity inputs. Sometimes uh, this is a lot harder when you're processing very very large payloads. The last thing is potential upstream support. That is something we would really really like to investigate. Uh, we hope there's enough sort of like consensus within the community that this is something we want in the project. It was mentioned in the, the keynote there at the end. Uh, there was a small shout out to large payloads. Um, so I'm super excited to see what the, the temporal team comes up with next. I've heard rumors of support starting within the next year, or at least some projects starting around it. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what comes out there. Finally, that was a bit about the architecture, things we've learned. Now I wanna talk about how we actually use it at Datadog and why we built it in the first place. 
So back in May, uh, Temporal launched, a, or excuse me, Datadog launched a brand new product, uh, partially built on Temporal called Workflow Automation. It it's a you know, low code editor that allows you to um, automate various processes. It plugs into all the various cloud providers, a whole bunch of third party APIs, as well as the entire Datadog project. Uh, probably doesn't come as a surprise that this Workflows product is built on a Workflow engine. Um, and that engine happens to be temporal. Uh, one of the things we quickly realized is that we needed a way to sort of like enable arbitrary low code workflows. Um, and for this, uh, we realized we needed to sort of like work around some of the limits within the temporal server. So we, uh, by allowing larger payloads to flow through the temporal system, uh, we were able to enable sort of like larger, more complex user defined workflows. And there's a, there's a large action catalog, hundreds of actions. So we have to be able to control for uh, input and output coming from any of these services. Uh, we don't exactly know how large that could be. We don't know how large the user input could be. Um, so this is one of the, the main driving reasons we implemented the large payload service. And um, it's worked very well for this. I didn't actually get to catch the retool talk, but I've heard they did something similar, um, especially with the large payload solution. Uh, so excited to hear from them as well. So that was my talk. I was originally scheduled for a lightning slot of 10 minutes, so I've managed to stretch it. Hopefully I didn't take too much of your time. Uh, the key takeaways here are that this enables very transparent large payload handling. Uh, we can, um, excuse me. Transparently handle large workflow and activity payloads for users without them having to actually go and augment their um, augment their workflows or activities to manually handle these large payloads. Uh, the large payload codec and server are now open source. I'll flash a QR code after this that you can scan to see the code. Uh, we'd love some feedback. I'd love to hear from everybody after this during the Q&A. Come find me, come find somebody from Datadog, let's chat. Um, yeah, and that goes to the last point. This is a very much experimental solution. It's worked for us. Uh, if you take this code and try to use it in production, please don't come hunt us down. Um, <laughs> we don't want to be liable for any of that. Uh, we mainly want to sort of dart, start a discussion on what a large payload solution would look like within the temporal ecosystem. Thank you.